I always look to my, my palate, my uh, whatever it, it's called, nose, uh, sensibility. The first thing with this is that it doesn't rip my head off. And uh, joining the show now is a fellow ascot wearer, Mick Fleetwood. How you doing, sir? Uh, doing fine, thank you. Uh, I thought I'd honor the day. I know you love them, and I do too, actually. I don't get much of a chance to wear them in Hawaii, where I'm sitting in my little music room. But uh, yes, hello, hello, hello. So where did your love for ascots begin? Well, it came from my father, who was a, a Royal Air Force officer. Uh, came out of the army, then went into the Air Force, and it was part of the culture. You know, we lived in the country, and Dad would always definitely put on a cravat to go down the pub. And I, I dutifully, as a young, young child, would wait for him to come back with some peanuts, and maybe I would be allowed a little uh, lemonade shandy, beer shandy. <laughs> and uh, he, he would always have his cravat on, and of course, my, my grandfather religiously wore cravat. Uh, that's all I can remember. That and one of the first cars I ever saw. Wow. Also, when you were young, you, you kind of developed a, a love for restaurants and you had your own little speakeasy. The, uh, what, what did you call your speakeasy? Club speak Keller. Club Keller, it was called. Oh, that's right. <laughs> you had like you, a you, connection you for um, your research. A little, a little bit. Yeah. Like right now is, um, is, is a very difficult time for restaurants. And of course, you, you own a restaurant. I do. I do. How, I do. How, how, have, how has that, um, how has the isolation and, and the shutdown um, impacted like, you know, the world that you live in from a restaurant perspective? It, 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 it of course, with anyone and everyone in whatever uh, sort of flow of life you, you were in, uh, it came to an abrupt stop. And it's all about taking care as much as you can of, of people, staff, that restaurants, as you well know, it's like having a family, an extended large family. Uh, we are trying our best to, to keep everyone um, positive uh, going into the future, but the, the grim reality is it stopped. So, it's nothing that anyone out there doesn't identify with being in that business. One of the things which, as a person, one being responsible as, as uh, one of the owners of, of my lovely restaurant, is the fact that you're, you're really keeping abreast of what and when and how you can look forward to the future. Um, and you, you keep a tempo and not a blind eye to what's going on to try and be ahead of the curve and be ready to, to open and, and celebrate coming back to the beginnings of, of what is a new norm, uh, doubtless. You know, you talk to some of the, the, the chefs out there and you know, they're just, some of them are afraid that they can't come back, <clears throat> you know, and it's just, it, it, of all the industries that have gotten hit by this world, it, the restaurant industry has just been devastated. Absolutely devastating. And it's also uh, what is sorely missed being recreated by, in truth, doing uh, our conversation is, is a conversation. And, and as we both well know, that is part and parcel of where you go to a, to a restaurant, in a pub, anywhere where people come together, uh, coffee house, wh whatever it might be, is about camaraderie and sharing an experience on, on numerous levels. And we miss that. You know, I, I miss that as, uh, as a person. Uh, and I miss, of course, being uh, a player. It's all about having an audience and having a rapport between yourself and what you do. What you present in the case of a restaurant is, is you get back what you put in. And people come back to an atmosphere, with obviously the food, uh, the way it's served and, and being receptive is, is part and parcel. But the, the whole total atmosphere 
is what you you gravitate towards and suddenly those little homes outside of your satellite home are not available so we're all uh, looking at how to reproduce and uh, it's a challenge and, and it, there is a positive part to it this is positive being able to uh, I haven't done uh, much online anything and I'm learning to do that so it's been actually a really uh, interesting experience is that is that something that you were just you know it feels like the whole world was kind of like everybody was going to like Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and all that. You <coughs> resistant, but before to, to get into the social world, if you will. I, I missed that last question. Where, where are you? So you, you had said that you're just now like getting a little bit more into the online world. Did you feel like you, this was, uh, you know, that you might've been like resistant before because, you know, really uh, social no. media. I, no, I understand now the question is, is I just have never been that way uh, educated into the technology of, of what it is. And obviously with my children and, and numerous, <laughs> numerous people around are glued to this whole online whether it's dating, all sorts of, of stuff. I know no, nothing that would push me away from it. Uh, I just wandered into it now because it's really my only it's now becoming my new best friend uh i'm a very uh, open hopefully an open person uh love meeting people so i i didn't feel the necessity uh, and i like the the presence of 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 real total reality is what it is but i'm learning in truth you can get very close to that um by pressing a button as well and and not having the experience control you, uh, which would be like in my world, when you, when you perform, when you record, yes, be available to use all sorts of influences from technology to even uh, people who inspire you, but, but don't have it consume you and then you lose yourself. And that would be my only little trepidation about not having the actual the touch and the, the tactile part of of what we're doing now but i think it's a it's a lesson well learned so i'm i'm enjoying uh sitting and it reminds me i think i'll have a sip <laughs> <laughs> yeah we need we probably should get into the to the tasting portion i saw you uh i snuck one in i did you I did, did you did sneak one in i did I, I won't hold you back. I, it's really unfair for me to ask you questions and sip. I, I should be I should be waiting a, alongside you, but <laughs> Guide, guiding me in, <laughs> guiding the missile in. Bad host. So the first thing that we're sipping here is a Jack Daniels uh, Tennessee uh, whiskey. It is a taster select. So this is uh, straight out of the barrel. This is a um, this was finished in oatmeal stout barrels. Now everybody thinks of Jack Daniels as being like this kind of like mainstream out there whiskey, but they actually have a really, uh, great, you know, lineup of whiskeys outside of that basic black label. And this is, this is one of my favorites of theirs that they've released in the last couple of years. And so, so when I'm, when I'm uh, cheers, cheers, or, or, so or, or what's the official so the official like tasting uh, route. Oh, so, so the first thing that I like doing with American whiskey is that I like I like analyzing the color. You kind of like get up in there and you, you you just look at the color and see. Very much like wine. You know, I'm more conversant with wine and but here, yeah. yeah. So with whiskey, it you know the barrel it gets all of its color from the barrel, whereas like the the wine gets uh, the color from the from the grape skins. Uh huh. That that uh, concentration from the from the connection with the grape skins. So I like to look at the color, and the older the the darker it is, usually the older it is, and the higher the proof. And then from there, I like to uh, to smell it. Now you've developed some perfumes and things in the past, so I'm assuming you have like a, a pretty good nose and a and and a, you're used to to nosing things. Love smell, yeah, love. So this is the most, this is the money maker for, for like a whiskey taster. Yeah. Nose. What, so this is, um, what are you picking up here? 
Well, n not knowing, but I was going to ask you as a relative novice, what, what is the, the wood of choice? That, that so the law, the, law that, uh, the law states it just has to be oak, but most people put, uh, put it in um, American oak, and it's uh, always charred. So it's like new charred um, American oak. And, um, it, and nothing else is it, it, anything else would be, be, yeah, they're using Japanese oak right now. They're using French oak. I mean, they're all over the place with what they're using, but the fact is, you know, it's an economic decision usually to, to focus on, uh, American oak. Okay. I thought it might've been some taboo I should know about, but it actually is a good comment, you know, um, in terms of, uh, what it gives Well, one of the first things, um, uh, for me, again, I'm learning as we talk here, really. Uh, I am conversant with having you know, enjoyed uh, ma mainly many years ago um, when I think the art of, of drinking is something we all learn. Mm -hmm. And when you're younger, you actually don't, you're more about the cause and effect of drinking versus the actual protocol and the art. Right. Um, so that in mind, I, I always look to my, my palate, my uh, whatever it, it's called, nose, uh, sensibility. The first thing with this is that it doesn't rip my head off. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of when it hits my palate, um, it's kind, it's not attacking me. Yeah. And so I'm, you have to bear with me how, how I describe things. No, I love that. I also uh, as a relative novice, I'm um, going through my, my first uh, choice here. Take me uh, through the process of how you, how you uh, take in aromas. How do you smell when, you are, when you're smelling a perfume or a flower or trying to take in the scents of a room? How do, you, how do you do it? Do you close your eyes? Do you take a moment? Do you want silence? I'm curious there. Uh, no, in interesting. Uh, I rely on, on most things in, in my being and my life are, not to get too highfalutin, I think are innocent mm. uh, and vulnerable and are the beginnings of, of accepting that it's my intuition. And intuition is, is something that we often turn away from and go like, I should have known. It was the first thing I ever thought. I, it was the first thing I ever thought about whatever the atmosphere, in this case, how th something hits you, a room, an atmosphere, an evening, uh, taste, smell. Um, so I, I rely on, on not changing my mind uh, as much as possible and being open to uh, how I might um, how, how something might hit me down the road by being educated, mm -hmm. but also remembering, which is okay to let go of things once you have more information. But um, I, I think I rely on, as a musician, just being in the moment and, and having a lot of trust in that. Yeah. And wait for, I'll remember parts of our conversation, and, when, and I hope that I will take it on board and go, well, hang on a sec, you could look at it in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, so intuition and immediately uh, feel. Feel in, in the presence of something happening, feel how it affects you, mm -hmm. which I suppose would be, I hope, being in tune with, with your body. Where would you rate, like, um, you know, smell in terms of your favorite senses huge i would say it's number one wow yeah. what like what's your what's your favorite, smell thing, touch. favorite thing to smell i i don't actually know but i do remember the first time that it really really affected me huh. uh and i'm just literally going there i can i can feel the experience i can remember as i'm telling you now which i probably haven't even thought of this in way over you know 20 years at least wow. my granny 
who was known as Little Granny, Gwen, lived in a, a gorgeous little English cottage, thatched cottage, which is neither here nor there. But on her staircase, she had this uh, bell puller that you have in churches with all the usually white and red and blue uh, sheepskin that, mm -hmm. that the bell ringers would pull. And she had one of those on her, ban instead of a banister, she had one of those going up the stairs. And this, of course, she had touched it every time she would go upstairs. So whenever I went to be with Granny, I would, I would apparently run straight to the staircase and smell the rope. Because it reminded me of my grandmother and I was actually in her house. So right from a child, I had this whole thing about smell, for yeah. sure. Uh, I, I remember my grandfather, how he smelled. Mm -hmm. And he probably, uh, from memory, he smoked a pipe. So probably there was some lovely uh, tobacco, ambiance, and the odd cigar. And I loved it. It was like a, opening a sea chest on, on an old galleon where sort of misty, uh, not dark, but, but, but wholesome wafts of, of something that seemed to come from another age. Wow. And I, and I remember as a child craving that, and I would go immediately upstairs for, at Granny's and just love sitting in her bedroom because it smelt of her. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, you know, for me, like, I, I have very similar experience. Um, and, you know, my listeners will know that um, I always talk about cornbread coming out of the oven and that's because my grandpa would always make cornbread in those iron skillets and i just know that smell so well you know so it's funny that you know we are so deeply connected to smell and and our memories and that's all that's all whiskey is 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 like breaking down these whiskeys is for me it's really tapping into my memory bank of the things I've smelled. There you go. It, it, it takes, it's like a signpost to a moment, very more than, more than often. And that's the whole experience uh, that can be taken into all sorts of other facets of life. But having, having a, a moment and, and enjoying the moment becomes a, a road that leads you into a whole conversation and takes you back and you can remember that's when that happened. And with this, it's power. Mm -hmm. And if you have uh, the information, you, you can get back there. You know, in your world, you'll be very conversant with, I know when, when I open a specific bottle, knowing what it is, you're, I'm sure, almost predetermined, you know what you're doing. And you, in a way, you're back to the, that first moment when you made, made your uh, decision uh, that you enjoyed that feeling. That and could, then you're off to the races after that. Yeah, it can be dangerous too, because sometimes you go on preconceived notions and the, it'll be like a different release of the whiskey. I, you know, so I always try to go in with an open mind, if you will. But I'm curious, does that, does that sense of smell, does it ever, does it ever come over um, to music? Like, do you ever do some stages or, or, or venues like have a particular uh, aroma that, you know, gets you excited to get on stage or, you know, something unique like that? Uh, but prob probably not. I think subliminally that there have definitely been, uh, now you're asking me, and I don't think it's a stretch. There were places that we used, mainly back in the day, that was small, therefore it, it was condensed and wasn't a giant arena or outside. And uh, we played pubs and all the little, not dressing rooms, they'd be like cupboards where you <laughs> be sho shoved into. Uh, but the actual ambiance and the smell of a particular club, a uh, venue, they would have, their own smell quite quite often and not all of it was always very good but but you would have the one where you go this feels good and it's just, it literally is like like opening a 
cigar, a box of cigars, you know where you are. We go like, okay, we're at the, the Nottingham, not, what was it, Nottingham Boat Club, which was a rowing club where we used to play a lot. It did have a great smell. And it's probably because underneath were all the beautiful wooden canoes mm -hmm. that were stashed uh, in the rafters where, where we used to play. It was probably because of that, where it was all these gorgeous, beautifully handmade uh, skulls, uh, uh, meaning long canoe racing that went on the river. So it had a smell to it. So now we go to probably the, the next one. I actually poured my last little bit of it. This is a uh, rhetoric 25-year-old. Uh, this is one of the oldest um, American whiskeys that, you know, you can, you can find in the market. Wow. I'm sure you have a preordained favorite here that you're not going to tell me. So I'm hoping that. I'm going to try and not influence you at all, Mick. <laughs> no, please do. <laughs> it's only a good thing. Now, what are you going to do with your favorite whiskey? Because you got, you'll have a little bit left over. Well, I'm going. I found upstairs, uh, actually, in my bedroom. Uh, I don't know. You'll be familiar with one of these flasks. So I have uh, my, and I have the the shot glass here, and I'm intending to fill uh, the favorite up with my little. Uh, walking flask, which is, of course, was used back in England when you went hunting and stuff. So I have two of these. Number one will be in here. Number two choice will be in here. I love and it. And they'll, they'll be put on my bedroom table uh, for inspiration. <laughs> well, hopefully no one, no one snags them from you when you're, when you're not no, looking. I, that, no chance right now. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so this one is, uh, you know, I, I would be curious if you could smell that rope that you talked about from your from your grand from your grandma's because this has a lot of those kinds of tones, and if you can, you know, pick up any of that kind of stuff in there. For me, this is, has a lot of tobacco, like a lot of like, uh, and actually pipe tobacco. That would be opening up the captain's chest. I like this one. Do you, um, when you, when you smell, do you ever open your mouth to smell to see if it, if it's a little different? Cause I have found that smell. Like a yoga breathing thing. Yeah. Yeah. Just open it with a little bit different with your, um, yeah. I like this one a lot. Mm. You know, I, um, or is it, it likes me. <laughs> it, I think it might be a good fit. I, I've tasted this many times and I like it now more than I did previously. And I don't know if that's because I just poured the last of the bottle. Um, or because that, you know, because when we taste, your, your, your palate is very much, uh, it's a muscle like anything else, right? So you're yeah. like one day I'll be in the mood for coconut. And so like a particular bourbon will really appeal to me. And another day I'll want like a big caramel bomb and that will really appeal to me. And so here I'm finding that this is just hitting every inch of my tongue in the right way. Like it's just, I'm getting the sweet, I'm getting the bitter, I'm getting like the nutty flavors. I mean, I really really love this Fleetwood Mac. I love, I love the band. Actually, I saw uh, you all in Vegas. The, I think it was the last show. Okay. Um, your, what I've always admired about you, you know, from um, the, the blues breakers to, to blue well is your, is your passion for the blues. Where does that come from? Early days in London, the first people that I met that were musicians and it was a, it was a fit. 
uh, I purely, I was never a, a, a technician. Uh, I just wasn't that type of player. So I, I found a perfect fit. And uh, my first uh, friend that I ended up playing with literally heard me playing in the garage uh, in, in my sister's house in London, which was a, a muse cottage. So you had the garage underneath, knocked on the door and said, do you, and I'd never played with anyone in my life. And he really knew his stuff from Nina Simone to Mose Allison, uh, some quite, when I look back, quite jazzy type of entities. And of course, early rock and roll, and then straight into where that all came from, which was Delta blues. So I started, learning and listening that was the first thing that ever happened to me when i went to london so just by circumstance i found that and of course that became the early especially with early fleetwood mac with peter green that was all we did which was to live out our musical fantasies really to to reproduce and to emulate all of our heroes which of course were were american blues artists that very often had been, you know, sadly at that point in time, forgotten about, to say the least, from whence they came, which was the United States of America, didn't really have any huge regard, uh, sadly. But in Europe, uh, like in the 20s, when a lot of American jazz musicians ended up in Paris and, and stayed there for good reason, where they were respected and their music meant a damn. So all of that came from really just happened sense through uh, Peter Bardens, who was the, the chap who knocked on the door, hearing me play drums in the garage. Wow. You mentioned uh, uh, Peter Green. How is he? I know you all just did like a, uh, a benefit, like in remembering him. How is he? He's, he's well. Uh, he's changed from, you know, he went through a whole emotional change, which is a way too long of a conversation to have. But he... Uh, I actually wrote to his, his caretaker today, and sadly, he, he loves to play every day in, uh, in a, at his house, and now he can't. So they're doing it, they're trying, <laughs> trying to do it online, where a dear friend of his who went around three days a week to play, just sitting on the couch playing guitar, he leads a very retreated life, uh, and, but his health is okay, and he's Peter. Peter, uh, with no ego, not everything we just did in London, he, uh, he approved of, but there, I could tell that he, he didn't, doesn't really understand what it was and what it's been, his music that, and the music he created. He has no ego at all. He had, no, has no regard for the fact that he did it and influenced so many people, uh, which is, charming so i'm i'm trying and did uh, that whole concert in london to acknowledge peter who started fleetwood mac and a lot of people don't know that they often think that me and john or myself were the founding fathers of fleetwood mac peter green was and we were happy to be playing with him so he's okay um he uh, he doesn't play anymore uh, outside of his home and life has changed and I accept him uh, as a changed person. Yeah. You know, I think um, if everyone in their life had someone like Mick Fleetwood who would, you know, take that extra step to show, um, show the rest of the world, you know, what they mean to the world, whether or not, you know, they want that or not. I think the world would be a better place. I, I, I remember when that happened, I just thought that was, it was selfless. It was beautiful. And I really do applaud you for, you know, giving Peter Green the kind of credit you have because not, well, not a lot of people would do that. Well, it, it, it was uh, in many ways, uh, it served me as well because it, it's part of my life, which was really set a, a tempo, uh, a standard that, went on for, and still is, of course, uh, having Fleetwood Max be, the band still be alive and well. And a lot of those lessons in, in being able to do that, I came from my, my days with Peter Green. 
and remembering what's important that people need to express themselves and not just be told to emulate someone who came before. Mm -hmm. And that's become our very odd history that we survived with that many musical changes is, is almost unique, uh, which I'm glad about that it had the integrity, uh, which Peter, of course, uh, back in those days, uh, we were so devoted to what we loved to do we, we didn't even think about how, where it was going or what it was going to, whether it was going to be successful or not. It was very, uh, uh, very pure. Mm -hmm. And you, know, you stray from that recipe, if you like, looking back at, the, at my career. But I, I hope that mostly it's been with the same recipe that has integrity for a band known as Fleetwood Mac. So I'm, I'm grateful for that. And with everything that happened in London, literally days before everything got closed down, were we have that feast. It was a miracle that everyone convened, all the incredible artists that came out for Peter and for this event has yet to be seen. Uh, and we're doing it uh, in a different way, uh, mixing down like this. Right. Very different for me not being able to grab a <laughs> an EQ button or, or be there in real time. But it, it's uh, it's something to look forward to. And, and I think that's one of the lovely things uh, that we all should be doing. And that to me is my signpost that it, it will come to pass, that this will be a different world and we will all start picking up the pieces and one of them for me will be presenting that lovely show in London. And we will just have to wait till it's right to do that. And patience is, is the requisite these days. <laughs> things I'm, I'm sad about and I, I know it just from I'm, I'm, a, I'm the first person to go up and just hug someone oh. like I that's me it, it, <laughs>